Well, um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for making your way back so promptly from the coffee break. Um, my name is Edward Lucas. I'm the international editor of The Economist and um, used to cover this part of the world in some detail. And we're here to talk about the energy, ge energy geopolitics of Central Europe. And I feel one doesn't really need the word energy because energy is the geopolitics of Central Europe, particularly now in these um, post-Cold War days. And we've got a very distinguished panel who I'm not going to introduce at length because if I did, it would take up the entire time allocated for this session. Um, Radek Sikorsky um, needs absolutely no introduction because he's just been speaking and anyone who doubts Poland's commitment to Visegrad just has to look at the Stachanovite workload that uh, Radek's been taking um, today in the panels. Um, we don't have the foreign minister of uh, Ukraine, Mr. Kozara, who's advertised at least on the out-of-date versions of your programs, but I'm very pleased that instead we have Radek Sikorsky who is, um, I, I was going to descri describe her as the top energy whiz in Hungary, which is the sort of way the economist describes people, but that's actually inaccurate. She's the advisor on energy and security to the Hungarian Prime Minister, Viktor Orban, and we're very grateful to Reka for stepping in at such short notice. Um, Pavel Oleknovic um, is the chairman of the board of the Central Europe Energy Partners and the leading light in Lotus, and I asked a Polish friend of mine how I should describe him and he said he took over a pile of complete junk and made it into a world-class energy company. So that's the, uh, that's the introduction I'm going to give you. I hope you're happy with it. And last but not least, we have Professor Alan Riley, who is in a way able to speak with greater freedom here because he doesn't have any voters or shareholders to worry about. And I describe him as the man who gives Gazprom nightmares. He um, thinks up ideas on energy security and energy regulation in Europe and has an amazing ability to communicate them and to make them happy. So we're going to um, hear him as well on this panel. But we're going to start off with a, a kind of um, what I think in diplomatic parlance is called a, a bilateral between me and Radek, uh, where we're going to discuss for a, a few minutes the, um, where we've got to, um, how we got here, and where we're heading. And then we'll go on from that to the rest of the panel. And I suppose the, 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 the first thing that strikes me is, is a point you made in your um, speech uh, earlier that the Central Europeans, the ex-communist countries, have really won the argument in a way that would have been seen as absolutely incredible at the time you joined the EU. The time we joined the EU, energy was seen as a commodity like any other, Russia was a country like any other, and anyone who complained about this was paranoid, neurotic, whinging. The, what, the, the, the whole idea of getting energy security, let alone the geopolitics of energy security, um, onto the agenda of the EU would have seemed really fanciful. And the Latvian energy commissioner really had a difficult time. We now have a German energy commissioner, and that train is running full speed. So you must be pretty pleased. But how, how do we get to that? Well, I, I, I think we were helped by, uh, by the Russians, actually. Uh, the uh, cutoff um, in the middle of winter, which was particularly uh, keenly felt here in Slovakia, um, uh, made everyone realize that, that this was for real. Um, uh, but um, I'm actually quite optimistic now, and it's not only because then it, it, the price of Brent crude went down below $100 uh, dollars per barrel in the last three days, but also because we've put together um, initiatives that are beginning to bear fruit. Uh, it's not just the uh, anti-monopoly uh, um, action by the European Commission. It's also the fact that Poland is uh, completing its LNG terminal, that new interconnectors have been uh, constructed and others are being planned, that virtual res res reverses have happened, um, uh, and that we have done, we, ha we are using our biggest energy resource in the region, which is, which is to conserve energy. Um, Poland, for example, has reduced its CO2 em emissions by 30% by comparison with 20 years ago. Uh, and um, we've introduced the kinds of things that Western Europeans have been doing for a while, like uh, sorting rubbish and then burning it in an efficient way, um, insulating buildings, um, which is, is dull, but extremely important. We all know that if uh, Ukraine's economy was as energy efficient as I think the Czech economy, 
uh, which is uh, to say uh, around the European average, um, Ukraine would be self-sufficient in gas. And that would be really important. Um, uh, we're getting there, so I'm, I'm much more optimistic uh, than, uh, than I was uh, before. Uh, International Energy Commission is projecting the price of gas to drop by 30% on average um, by the end of the decade, which I think will be good for, uh, for us geopolitically, good for our consumers, and also actually good for Russia. Because I believe that it is in the long-term interest of Russia to become like Norway, to make a lot of money out of selling energy, but to be able to do it in a competitive rather than monopolistic fashion. Well, you've just mentioned the, the word monopolistic, and that brings us on to something else that the European Union has done, which is really attack Gazprom's business model in Europe. I'm, I'm, I'm sure the EU would say it wasn't Gazprom's business model in particular. They were just attacking the, the general idea of vertically integrated um, energy, en energy supplies. But it's, we've, we've seen an astonishing thing of European Commission officials bursting in with search warrants into the uh, Gazprom offices all over Europe. And the European Commission saying that the various things that Gazprom do are actually illegal. And how's that, how's that, how's that been, been working out in Poland? And how, how do you see that progressing? Well, um, because each of our countries was a relatively small market for Gazprom, uh, I, I believe Gazprom was taking advantage of it, and I think high time. Um, and I think the Russian authorities have also recently realized that uh, Gazprom has been losing market share. And that's why we, some of us have been ger getting um, discounts. Um, so I hope we all um, learn from all this. We, we have no quarrel with the fact that God gave Russia gas and oil. Uh, and there is nothing morally or molecularly wrong with the Russian gas. And we want to continue to, to consume it. But uh, the relationship between producer and customer has to be more uh, equitable. And um, Russia needs to get used to the fact that the third energy package will be implemented. Uh, and I think in due course will um, adjust to a more competitive environment. Yeah. And yet there's still the feeling that where Russian gas goes, Russian politics follows. And I'm sure this is quite unfair, and it's, it, I say this in a, in a slightly um, jocular spirit, but um, when the news broke in Poland that your um, gas transit company was considering a, um, a, a second ga Russian gas line, which would bypass um, Ukraine, which would obviously be good for Russia to exert, um, exert pressure on, on Ukraine and might have other benefits, and, and this was in a strategic industry, which I think under Polish law is meant to notify such things to the government first, because it's, it's sen obviously sensitive. And the joke was that um, President Putin knew more about um, what uh, Poland's gas policy was than, um, than, than Prime Minister Tusk's government did. Um, how, how did you interpret the, the, this, this news when it came out? Oh, P Poland wants to be, just like other countries, a, a, a transit country. Uh, we have a, a joint venture with Gazprom uh, over Yamal, and uh, um, uh, a pipeline which carries uh, from Russia to Germany uh, double uh, Poland's annual consumption of gas. Um, so when there are business propositions to, to do more uh, transit, uh, we're always interested in looking at them. And when companies um, decide to exchange information, um, that's fine for the companies to do. They will eventually have to come to the government for approval, and then the government will uh, make its own decision. And it would obviously pave the way for that approval if they consulted you properly first. Sorry? It would obviously pave the way for that approval if they consulted you properly first, rather than you having to read about these new initiatives in the newspapers. Well, uh, you know, the time at times at which we controlled companies on a day-to-day -day basis are <laughs> happily over. Uh, the commercial sector can, uh, can have dreams, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, the government in its regulatory capacity will determine uh, what's in the uh, long-term interest of the country and what uh, fulfills Poland's uh, energy strategy. 
And I, I might just finish up before we go on to the, the rest of the panel with a question about nuclear um, power, because Poland has an ambitious civil nuclear program, which is putting you in a very interesting position that the French, perhaps the first time in many years or ever, are trying very hard to be nice to Poland because they want to sell you civil nuclear power plants. And you're also in the position of being able to sell that electricity when the plants are generated to Germany, which has closed down its own plants. So, it's given, so this, the geopolitics of energy security isn't just going eastwards, it's also going westwards as well for you. Well, Poland wants to have a healthy energy mix. Uh, at the moment, um, uh, over 90% of our electricity is generated from coal. So it's actually very important to apply techniques of burning coal more cleanly, because that is for us the cheapest way and the, the affordable way to reduce uh, emissions. Um, uh, but uh, we also need a, um, a, a base load, and um, nuclear is, is good for that. Um, I'm not sure about the economics of it. Apparently, uh, uh, electricity prices have uh, dropped recently. Um, but, uh, but, but these um, nuclear plants would, again, be built by private companies. And it's up to them to uh, make the case for the government to be able to accept it or reject it. Mm. Well, thanks very much indeed for that, Radek. I'm going to turn straight to your um, neighbour to the south geographically and to your left on the panel, um, Reka, to give us a Hungarian point of view, because you've had a tremendous battle. I don't know whether people here have been following the details of Hungarian energy history over the, um, uh, the history of Hungar Hungarian energy politics over the past few years, but you've had an extremely unwelcome Russian shareholder in your main, um, in your main energy company, which you booted out with some difficulty, and you've had a slightly unhappy relationship with your Austrian neighbours, so um, who were perhaps um, giving you some unpleasant surprises from time to time, and you've also got some difficulties to the south in the former Yugoslavia. So it's never a dull moment in the world of Hungarian energy security. Give us a flavour of what, what, what's on your desk, and also whether you share um, Radek's rather optimistic approach to where we've uh, what, what we've achieved in the last uh, last eight or nine years. Well, it's uh, my real honour to be here, and I think very much the organizers to invite uh, us and to put this topic on the panel because I think on the conference because I think this uh, panel is really highlighting one of the key strategic challenges to Central Europe to all of our countries and I'm particularly honored to be sitting next to uh, the foreign minister of Poland because I have the honor to have been decorated by him the Bene Merito decoration well for working and well that's very kind I really appreciate so I I think I'm really one of those um, persons uh, that, who has worked since my career has started in 1990 on Central European relations. And so I think it's a very relevant question to discuss you know, what we have achieved in the past two decades practically and how far we've gotten. And the question of you know, whether there is energy geopolitics is very interesting and very relevant from the point of view of taking a look at the um, import portfolios that we continue to have. And I think that really highlights some of the uh, uh, um, uh, results, or that is the proper perspective from which we can analyze the results of our developments. What I can, um, uh, what we have to note, I think, in this uh, um, short uh, question is that uh, we have had a major strategic challenge uh, in the beginning of the 1990s, and there are several ways to respond to this major st uh, strategic issue of, uh, of how to solve a diversification of an import portfolio, which really threatens just not one sector of the economy, but has the influence over the entire economic functioning of a country. So it's uh, obviously a very relevant uh, sovereignty issue. So it's not a Russophobia that was driving, I believe, uh, the Central European governments, but it was a very pragmatic and very realistic um, understanding of the facts of life. Uh, and I think in this, you know, there is a very strong competition among the Central East European countries, you know, who is more dependent on Russian imports. Um, but I think what we have, uh, the way we have responded in Central Europe was to design the, the sort of the grand plan, the grand design of what we would like to see in Central Europe developing a real, to achieve a real market, because we believed that the functioning of a real market is really 90% uh, at least of a solution to a strategic challenge. 
uh, we have designed this grand plan, which even until about what, 10 years ago was not accepted, the northern LNG terminal, to have an idea of a southern LNG terminal as an input of non-Russian gas into the central European region, as well as having a north-south interconnector and having the Azeri gas uh, coming into the central European markets. But after designing the grand design, or the grand plan, uh, the way we were trying to implement it was not as strategic as the design of the plan. And I think that's why it is very important to go back, because the way we've really followed uh, through the, these past uh, 15, 20 years is not a strategic uh, um, uh, sort of one-hit-all approach, but it was more an incremental strategy or an incremental tactical one step after the other. And that has a perfect rationale and that has a relevance, obviously. Uh, we put certain parts of the, the picture into material existence, but it's a very risky uh, approach, because whether you can be successful based on an incremental approach is not dependent on you, it's dependent on time. And how long this window of opportunity is there for the Central European regions to really achieve the kind of uh, energy market uh, is uh, very dubious and very questionable. We don't really know when uh, we have um, uh, until when we can cooperate, and I think that depends on a large number of factors. We in Hungary, for instance, are tightened by the fact that our long-term contract is going to expire in 2015 with the Gazprom, so we will, we will have to start the renegotiation in the very foreseeable future. Uh, but what is, I think, behind all this is um, um, cer certain pre-assumptions that uh, European thinking on energy was based on, and I think these pre-assumptions if they are wrong, obviously, they can lead you to a very wrong um, uh, uh, end where you never want it to go. One of these three assumptions was that energy was going to be a market commodity. A second assumption, I think, that was determining uh, European thinking was that the, the influence of politics over energy was going to decrease because it's really just a, uh, a relic of the communist past and over time it will diminish or disappear. And the third assumption was that energy trade is able to create a reciprocal dependence because by exporting your um, euros or our euros uh, towards the um, uh, uh, major import source or major uh, uh, import source, we're also exporting our values and they are just as dependent on the revenue side uh, on the trade relations uh, with Europe. So fundamentally it creates a reciprocal dependence uh, and that creates stability. Well, I think it doesn't take much to understand that such windows of opportunity may exist in which a reciprocal dependence creates uh, stability, but you cannot base stability on a long period of time on such a dependence because in, in, a, in a reciprocally or mutually dependent situation, there is every strategic rationale for both partners, in fact, to want to quit that equation. And the one who quits faster, of course, is the winner. So the one who diversifies faster is, a, is, a, is, a, is, in a, is in a winning position. So I think from this perspective, if we take a look of what happened really in Central Europe, we, had, we can actually have two readings of the developments. One is that uh, we managed to create a very cooperative centralist Euro Central European uh, political and I ideological, I would say, value-based uh, framework of uh, an atmosphere of uh, working together. We have also been successful in turning the tide over in Brussels, in conveying our arguments in a very systematic and very solid way, in pers pers persuading our partners uh, of our interests and special views. Uh, we have actually been also successful in putting certain bits and pieces of this grand design into reality, such as the Hungarian uh, uh, Romanian interconnector, the Hungarian Slova uh, Croatian interconnector, we're working on the Hungarian Slovakian interconnector. Uh, the Polish LNG terminal is a very important component of this. This is also under construction. So there is a positive reading of what has happened. And there's another reading, I think, which is also equally relevant uh, when we look back uh, to what happened in the last 20 years. Because obviously, when you have such a grand design, you need a very constant, solid political support behind it to realize it, especially if you follow the incremental approach. It has to go across governments, it has to go across political parties, it has to go across decades. Uh, and you have to have a very significant um, uh, stock of uh, financial resources as well to realize all the elements. And I think when um, we proposed such a sort of 
one hits all more in a quick strategic response uh, a solution to Central European issues. That was the idea of a Central East European Strategic Energy Fund, for instance, to uh, start to cooperate together on, on these plans. Um, and instead of that, the actual choice of this incremental approach, I think, uh, leaves a lot of questions open. It results, for instance, for a landlocked country like Hungary to remain in the same in portfolio import portfolio after 20 years and to practically face the uh, negotiations in a very similar uh, s uh, political situation as we have we would have faced um, 15 years ago thanks very much indeed Rekha. so you're saying the the ideas are good but the the incremental implementation has been so slow that you're not yet where where you want to be we'll, we'll come back into, into the discussion later and i think we've had the kind of the yin and the yang here of the optimism and the and the pessimism. But I'm now going to turn to um, Pavel uh, Oleknovich because you're in this not for political reasons, you're in it to make money and to um, your company delivers very good returns to its shareholders. So I'm very keen to have your perspective um, on this as a, as a practitioner and expert in the, in, in the energy field. Do we really need to think about geopolitics at all? Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, a few words about the SIP, Central European Energy Partners. So this is a think tank, not a, let's say, the active uh, operating business organization, but uh, organization, uh, uh, you know, collecting the CAOs from energy sector from uh, the region, 11 countries, Central European region, that we want to speak with one voice to Brussels, to the, on a European, uh, level. Uh, why? Because that voice it's, uh, as a group of uh, companies and the countries, uh, this is a quite an important stakeholder and it must be listened uh, on a European level. And uh, it works quite well. We've been talking about uh, only energy mix. Of course, we have scientists inside also supporting us, but talking about that, that uh, kind of a activity which is uh, like uh, for economy uh, driving force um, and uh, the changes going on a discussion going on on a european level uh, related to the co2 re reduction in europe or uh, uh, greenhouse effect or any other things in our opinion are focusing the more or less of the let's say certain individual area uh, belonging to the energy mix we have to stand back and uh, try to find the best way of kind of philosophy, how to proceed with the changes within energy mix to create a better, let's say, environment, better life of uh, living for a people, wherever they are, and uh, you know, better environment in Europe as well. And of course, to give a chance to uh, individually by countries develop its own projects uh, which based on um, indigenous energies, so which are, exist like coal, you know, like gas, like coal is so, somewhere, and think to become more independent, not uh, fully dependent like we are today, talking about the gas dependency and uh, oil as well. So uh, the year ago, uh, uh, we commissioned uh, uh, the report regarding energy mix in Europe as a whole. Uh, that's a very interesting uh, uh, you know, picture, uh, giving us kind of information uh, just after the, let's say, integration of, uh, of the EU, means uh, the Eastern countries uh, uh, the time when they join the uh, EU afterwards. Uh, talking about uh, energy mix and talking about uh, GDP growth. The, our region is uh, one third to only part to the, the more mature EU 15. And from that time, after 2005, nothing positively happened. Means the gap is very big, talking about economy development and even widening. So that's a signal which we observe and try to announce on uh, the European level 
that bringing the more and more problems, seeing, you know, the discussion about a partnership within the EU, but uh, a reality, uh, observing individual actions, uh, the big players uh, having uh, uh, contract and uh, projects, you know, with the external of the EU uh, uh, players. That's including Russia and China and others. Uh, so, therefore, we try to raise that as a very important thing that we should, uh, should be taken on a European level, that we, of course, want to improve the position of each of the countries and uh, region within EU uh, group, uh, but we have to have the proper support. That's, of course, financing inside, but the rules, regulations, and partnership are very much on that our agenda. Today we presented, uh, just before uh, this uh, conference started, uh, having a panel, uh, we presented uh, another report prepared by uh, Roland Berger, uh, which is an uh, energy price issue. And we w want to initiate the kind of a philosophy uh, regarding energy mix changes, how we can, you know, uh, proceed with that changes. Do not talking about uh, uh, reduction of emission, do not tackling, you know, that very, very important uh, actions uh, going on, but try to think from the, uh, the position of uh, us, of the client, uh, and energy price. Are we smart enough to accept, you know, the cheapest price? Not really. We are uh, ready to accept the relevant price. Uh, it's the price of energy consisting, uh, let's say, in a cost chain structure. All of the cost before we pay, you know, for, let's say, electricity, for energy, means uh, uh, the question about the uh, environment, the question about uh, problems with our health, coming out of technology, existing, and how that changes should be, uh, let's say, uh, defined, and then on a which area of uh, energy uh, the money should flow to for investment. Of course, you know, to simply for uh, uh, experts, uh, it's uh, clear that uh, we should uh, utilize uh, uh, such a energy uh, like uh, based on the gas, like renewables, uh, clean, like uh, uh, nuclear, uh, but with a very high risk for a people if something happened that we are not uh, the, the, the fan, like happened in Japan. So there are many things for further consideration that uh, should be tackled and should be discussed coming from the uh, area of the uh, price of uh, energy. You will be able to, to, to get that uh, report and see what's uh, put it into that. And we'll, of course, uh, uh, will try to spread out uh, what from our side is uh, important and necessary to be tackled on a higher uh, level, including politicians in, uh, in Europe. Uh, so, uh, there are uh, many actions prepared by us uh, and we will uh, go for a presentation uh, next uh, week's uh, coming in Vilnius once we have our annual meeting uh, and, uh, and uh, before Lithuanian presidency in EU will start. Uh, so to conclude that, uh, SIP is a thin stack which take care uh, trying to take care about uh, issues related to the energy mix and observing some problems which <coughs> we want to deliver to the players, decision makers to be solved and uh, value for the members of the SIP is that we are as a company, like myself, I am head of a Lotus group and others uh, belonging to that uh, structure, 
that we are living in that environment <coughs> and we are spending money, you know, developing uh, com uh, companies, you know, and uh, uh, developing new, new strategy based on uh, rules defined on a European level and coming down to the each acting countries in that region. The voice from us is uh, very much addressing the position of a central European economy and central European, uh, let's say, position within the, uh, the rest of the group, EU, and without the support, without the partnership within EU, observing what's going on. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I may say that uh, I am worried about the future of Europe. Well, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Oleknovich. And um, I'm, on that note, uh, I'm going to turn straight to Alan Riley, because you've been saying you need a lot more from the EU than what we've got, um, more decisiveness, better rules and so on. Um, and that's your specialty. Well, if, if Mr. Ertinger was sitting here in the front row and you were giving him instructions, what would you tell him to do? And while you were at it, you might also give the Polish government and the Hungarian government some hints as well. well I think where you start is you say that, and I think I can answer uh, Rekha's uh, negative or positive, pessimistic view. And I, I think where you start is to say that um, for the European um, energy liberalization project uh, starts in Western Europe and moves eastward. And um, one of the criticisms that is made of, um, from Moscow is to say that, you know, in relation to the Gazprom case, is that somehow the European Commission is picking on Gazprom. Uh, they're not picking on Gazprom because they've first of all picked on any and Gas de France and Electricity de France and every major energy company in Western Europe. And essentially, having broken the back of opposition to liberalization and attacked anti-competitive practices in Western Europe, the guns of the Commission turn eastward. And that is what you're seeing with the Gazprom antitrust case. And what I think we're seeing rolled out from West to Eastern Europe is a compound effect of three factors. The first of all is the actual liberalization process, the technical liberalization process. The second is the creation of interconnectors, partly through European programs, partly through member state programs. And then you have the antitrust case on top of it, the Gazprom antitrust case. And this is really quite important because it's going to threaten a number of traditional practices which have been operating uh, in that region, and not just by Gazprom, by other companies as well, in terms of denial of third party access, uh, in, uh, allegedly, I must remember, allegedly in terms of uh, third party access, um, uh, uh, in, other, in other forms of suppression of competition that um, may or may not have taken place. Um, and then, and most crucially, this issue of the index, of the indexing of gas prices to oil prices. The Commission's essential position is this. Whilst it may have been acceptable to do this in 1973, uh, when a large amount of um, oil was used power generation. Today, power generation by oil is 3%. And the argument is, as a matter of European competition law, how can a company which is dominant use a pricing mechanism which has no modern market justification? And that is reinforced by the fact that now about 45% of the uh, um, gas sold in Europe is no longer linked to oil at all. At all, it's just uh, on, the, on the spot market. So th th this is the Commission's argument, and we'll see how that plays out. But this is much more dynamic <coughs> than it first appears, because the actual competition case itself is focusing upon the, um, the, case, the actual uh, territories in Central and Eastern Europe. But the point is, is if the Commission rules that indexation is unlawful, and it's upheld by the EU General Court, that will trigger all of the price reviews in all of the contracts of Gazprom in Western Europe. So the consequence is, it's not just, it doesn't just knock out all the Eastern European indexation, it knocks out the Western European indexation as well. And I think even worse for Gazprom is the fact that any ruling like that will be used worldwide by the Chinese in their negotiations with the Russians over their gas price to pay for the Eastern Siberian gas, for the Japanese on any energy. So it has a global effect. So this is, this is, we're talking something here which is very, very big indeed. 
So you've got the, the actual technical legal liberalization program. You've got the interconnection uh, of the, the interconnectors being put in place at e with, through EU and national funds. And then you've got the antitrust case. So what I'm saying is that, yes, we have struggled over the last two decades, but we are moving in the right direction. And the other major factor is the, uh, the actual the liquidity in the global gas markets because of the shale revolution. Right? One of the points I always make about this is without a single molecule of shale gas being produced in Europe, it, shale gas is having an enormous impact here, the dumping of LNG because the US markets are closed. We've had coal being dumped in Europe because the co US coal can no longer be sold in the US markets. There is also a series of final investment decisions which have been made which will result in more LNG coming available from 2015. So there is more and more liquidity coming into the market. And that is going to put immense pressure on uh, the traditional uh, domestic monopoly uh, companies and their long-term supply contracts with Gazprom and other na national exporting companies. So all that is really putting immense pressure on the traditional system and pushing it in the direction <coughs> of a much more liberalized and open competitive market both in Western and in Eastern Europe. And then there is the prospect, potentially, of shale gas. Uh, and now, there's lots of issues about how that's going to all play out, but there are all sorts of dynamics here which are really fascinating. It almost doesn't matter which European state starts producing shale gas, because if one or two states start produ producing shale gas, it will, first of all, create a displacement effect. They won't use LNG. That means more LNG available for the states. I think you can also rely on the natural competition between the states. So that, you know, well, my, my classic example is if Perfidious Albion is first and they start producing shale gas at any uh, stage at, uh, you know, in the north of England, a few billion cubic meters, I think you can pretty much guarantee that south of the channel, the French shale gas ban will not last long. But the point about that, that was then will also displace LNG, which will, of course, tr um, provide more supply for everyone else. So the overall effect of this is, is really quite profound. There's another factor as well. There is actually external interest in coming in and uh, developing shale gas in the European Union. One example of this is the Japanese. The Japanese do not want um, th to see a lot of LNG going elsewhere than Japan, and they want lower prices. These pesky Europeans building these LNG terminals, this is terrible. They've got a $10 billion shale gas investment fund. What is the likelihood that the smart Japanese will realize helping to develop, develop shale gas in Europe will ensure that the LNG goes to Japan at low prices rather than creating a competition for that LNG. So there are all these dynamics coming into play and all these dynamics are fairly positive for European supply security. Well, thanks very much indeed, Alan. And I wish we had a map, really, to illustrate this because you would see the European energy security map of, say, 1991 or 1989 when communism collapsed, and it was all east-west. And the gas was in the east, the, consu the consumers were in the west, and there was very few ways of getting it. And now it looks like a spider's web. You've got these north-south interconnectors that have been, been referred to. You've got the liquefied natural gas, LNG terminals coming in. You've got power connections between the countries. So it's already resilient and diversified in a way that would have seemed unimaginable um, if we'd been sitting here um, 20, 24 years ago. Um, so I'm just going to come back to the panel very briefly, and I'd urge you in the audience to start sharpening your questions. And if you just want to say that um, this is all wonderful and it's great to be in Bratislava, save that for the, the break. It's controversial questions are much more, are much more interesting. Um, but I just want to come back briefly to the panel and just ask them um, to, both to come back if they want to on the um, points that the other panelists have made, um, but also on um, the uh, point I, I would just like to mention that we've still sort of skirted around um, the question of, um, the, the, the question of uh, Russia, because Russia is not sitting back passively in this. Russia is not sitting there and saying, oh dear, our business model and the foreign policy model that go with it is, is broken. And they're, for example, pushing quite hard on South Stream. So I'd like to, um, I might come back to, to Reka, first of all, on this briefly. Um, you know, you've put a big investment in Nabucco, which is the other, the rival pipeline to South Stream, the so-called EU or Western-backed pipeline that would bring gas from Azerbaijan to, um, to Central Europe via Turkey and the Balkans. Russia's storming around the Balkans, signing up people, making speeches, even Putin himself turning up for his rare public appearances. 
how worried are you? Do you think the pipelines are now irrelevant in the days of, of LNG and shale gas, or um, what's, your, what's, what's, your, what's your take on that? I think, uh, I think South Stream as a project is very understandable from a, a, a root diversification point of view. And it makes sense in many ways from that perspective. But the root diversification problem is uh, not a Hungarian problem or not even a Central European problem, it's a Russian problem. And it solves a Russian problem and I think it's uh, perfectly legitimate in its place. Obviously, if, that, if such a project is ever going to be built, uh, it is a very clear interest uh, to the potential countries to compete and to try to make the route uh, uh, according to their national interest. But I think ultimately the future or this, the, uh, the fate of South Stream is going to be dependent very much on Russian-Ukrainian relations. And I think that's uh, sort of a long-term view. But there is another development which I think really f needs to be mentioned. And I didn't want to avoid your question in the previous round uh, uh, in answering that. Uh, and I think that's an, an attention to developments in the Balkans. And I think that's also very relevant and I think that on Unfortunately, that goes unnoticed, both in Washington and uh, definitely in Europe, but um, to varying degree, of course. And I think while we tend to think that with um, uh, um, certain numbers of the a number of countries in the Balkans uh, joining NATO, uh, joining the European Union, or on track of joining the European Union, the solution, uh, the, the problems of the regions are more or less solved, and the solution is sort of Western integration, C and Croatia, that's a done deal. Croatia would be an example. Definitely, Croatia is yeah. a, a next uh, sort of solved tick-off uh, tick issue, yes. which is wrong, <coughs> because while we, I think it's, it's, a, it's an approach that's very superficial, ra ra rather, because I think what is really de developing over the last few years is another trend. There is a very clear attention to developments in the Balkans by Moscow. And I think there's a very clearly strengthening presence and interest and strengthening bilateral relationship, which uh, uh, influences the entire uh, developments in the Balkans. And since we have a very uh, clear, we as, I believe, Central Europeans, but definitely we as Hungarians, a very clear strategic interest in cooperating with Croatia in getting that uh, LNG terminals, uh, gas into the Central European markets, not just Hungary's, but also Slovakia's, and potentially into this bigger network of gas interconnectors. Uh, we believe that a Central European strategic relationship is of interest for us and for uh, these countries in the Balkans, definitely of Croatia. Yet, it's not happening, and I think it's, oh, well, the, um, it's not fair. Uh, the feasibility study is now being prepared by the Croatian government, but I think, again, um, uh, that shows a, a mysterious loss of a few years in uh, actually materializing or implementing a major strategic project. Right. Radek, you might want to come back on whether you see Russia's um, energy strategy evolving for either good or bad, but also perhaps you could just give us a few words on shale gas, which has really put, if we were doing that energy map of Europe, which we uh, referred to earlier, it wouldn't just have pipelines for importing other people's energy, it would be actually producing. Poland used to be a major oil producer 100 and something years ago, I think, and uh, now those, uh, the geologists have found what seem to be enormous reserves of shale gas. How, how's, that, how's that going to change the picture? I, I, I'm reluctant to um, misrepresent myself as an energy expert in the presence of Professor Riley, um, but I'll, I'll come back to shale let me just add a few figures on the transportation routes because I think they are, uh, uh, if you confirm them, uh, that they uh, give you a picture. Um, namely, um, according to my data, uh, Russia's export of natural gas to Europe was 150 billion cubic meters in 2011 and it has now dropped to 138.8 .8 billion cubic meters last year. Uh, Poland has consumed less, Slovakia less, uh, Hungary also less. Now, the transport infrastructure uh, allows uh, at the moment to transport 247 billion cubic meters. That's Nord Stream at 55, Yamal Europe across Poland 33, 
the Ukrainian system, 143, and Blue Stream to Turkey, uh, 16 billion uh, cubic meters. Um, so, 247 billion capacity, actual sales, uh, much less, 138. Now, if the Russians were to build all of the things that they're talking about, South Stream, uh, and I think that includes North Stream, uh, pipe number three and four and, and some others, um, they would get the capacity to transport 379.9 billion cubic meters of gas. Now, what for? I mean, that's two and a half more than they're actually selling. I mean, is that a good use of, um, of your money? I don't think so, but, um, but it wouldn't be the first time. Um, as regards Shell, um, uh, Poland was the country where last year the first fra uh, hydraulic fracturing um, um, procedure, the, fir the first time in Europe, was actually performed. And uh, we will have um, dozens of drilling this year, and, and um, by next year we'll be in a much better position to know what we actually have. Uh, simultaneously, we are developing the um, uh, legal um, framework, and we have already announced that the government take will not exceed 40%, which I think uh, uh, is um, reasonable. Um, there is vigorous discussion about uh, the role of uh, local producers and the role of the state, uh, but uh, I'm confident we'll produce a friendly um, uh, legal ev environment so that we may extract this stuff as soon as possible. Thanks very much. I, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to Alan uh, Riley in, in a moment for just for maybe a comment on what he thinks of the regime, but I'd first of all like to go to uh, Mr. Oleg Novich, just to ask you, what, what do you and your members feel about relations with Russia? Russia's been historically your big um, import partner. Do you share the view which has been expressed on the panel that Russia is now a costly and unreliable supplier of energy and um, is um, about to face a very tough time indeed? Okay, that's uh, everything lying on a strategy and uh, uh, I may say that uh, energy security issue. I remember my time, you know, when I went to uh, Switzerland, uh, we, we had quarter and we discussed uh, on a headquarter level about the uh, idea which was delivered uh, uh, on that time from Russia, from Moscow, that we are going to build a uh, new Primorsk and the pipeline, you know, and new direction, you know, for uh, crude oil and gas trans transportation. Okay, and uh, the years that investment will be finished and they will utilize, and uh, giving also the, the information that uh, our Druzhba pipeline uh, will work, uh, let's say, less, so to speak, yeah? Uh, and then uh, diversification, you know, it, it uh, I in my opinion and our opinion, would be people would discuss, it was kind of logic, you know, from Moscow, nothing, let's say, uh, against uh, Europe, but logic from the Russian's po point of view, uh, you know, and they go to logistic, but economically, absolutely unacceptable and unlogic. So, and uh, even top players, you know, much, much, uh, uh, let's say, uh, better being on the market than me. They were, you know, uh, skeptic with that uh, opinion that, okay, Russian will never start with that. So we have Primorsk, we have Primorsk to starting, you know, we should know uh, and we should listen to what's going on in Russia and Moscow when they address uh, their strategy and their decisions and that their responsibility that they have money or they haven't. Huh? The same, you know, economically like, uh, uh, you know, um, also uh, being under the big discussion before it started, this is a um, pipeline under the Baltic Sea for the gas. Mm -hmm. So it exists and they've been talking about another one, even economically yes. is uh, not proven, so to speak. That's a kind of strategic, uh, uh, let's say, issue for okay. that. We should treat, from my point of view, and 
uh, my experience, we should treat Russians as a friends for a business, but we have to be once it's constructed a European group, we have to uh, answer ourselves, do we want to uh, be stable, do we want to have stability within that EU, and how we may, uh, let's say, support each other to improve our its individual economy. Do not to find individuality, just find a solution how to help each other. That's a quite a big region, diversified economy and uh, logic solutions, you know, around. How to find a glue to, you know, let's say, to be to the partnership position. I am not afraid about Russia, but, uh, you know, provided that we have the smart solution, not to fight, but to cooperate, to work with that. We should, uh, talking about the shale gas and uh, the situation worldwide, we have to focus on what's going on in America. Uh, you know, and that's a worry for Europe as well. You know, previously, the uh, heavy industry moved to, was moved to, to China, to uh, Korea, to that. It, it was uh, the time that uh, the people doing that, uh, you know, delivering delivered message here. That is uh, fantastic, you know, because we all get more money here, uh, so, but not doing hard work, so to speak, eh? getting more, more profit. Uh, yeah, but we are losing our GDP in the position, yeah. okay? The, we have to have something to work, you know, that's uh, not only uh, tourist business and uh, the banks. Uh, the we have to have, you know, the factories uh, here, and now, what's going on in America with a cheaper gas, and the same, it's coming with oil, because the, the tight oil, uh, it's uh, together with uh, shale gas coming, okay? Yeah. And they uh, already uh, produce in America over one billion barrels a day, uh, tight oil. So that's an important message, what is going to happen in the years. Good. Um, uh, now, I, I see one question over there already. Please do try and catch my eye. There's another one there. So I think we've got some roving microphones. But I just want to ask Alan very briefly just to come back on what's in, in, in a, just a minute or so. What's your take on the way Poland has managed its shale gas inheritance, its shale gas discovery so far? And then we go to questions. Well, I, I think there is a, there's a tendency to uh, criticize the Polish government uh, because nothing seems to be happening. And the answer is that, you know, these things don't happen overnight. I mean, it took George Mitchell and the Barnett Shale from 1981 right up until about uh, 1996, 97, before we started producing anything. And then to get to scale was about 2000. So, you know, it's not going to take that long because we've now got the technology and the know-how. We've got to work out how the geology works. You've got to put the structures in place. Uh, you've got to organize the capital, you've got to build the pipelines. This is, this, is, this is not something which is done overnight. And I think it's the graduated steps towards it of actually building up the structures, the legal structures, the physical structures, bringing in the capital, and then rolling it out. And I think you will see in the next year or so, um, as Rodek said, was we're going to get into some numbers on, on what the actual resource base is actually like and what it's like to be produced. And then, you'll, then it will all begin to flow from there. And what I think would be quite surprising is there comes a point, and we saw this with the US uh, situation, is that quite quickly it begins to move uh, once you get to, to some degree of scale. And that's really quite important. So there's, there's, there's a couple of other points I'd just like to make. And this is actually reinforcing what uh, Radek was saying about the pipelines. And I think the, 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 the position the Russians are taking is unbelievably odd. I mean, to build all those pipelines, Nord Streams 1 to 4, Yamal 2, South Stream. If you look at the International Energy Agency uh, World Energy Outlook Report for 2011, it's a huge section on the Russian energy sector. And what they say is that for gas, they need to spend $730 billion in 2010 dollars by 2035. And they have to spend that on the distribution network in Russia and on new gas fields. They have to replace about three quarters of the current production by 2030. There's no sign they're spending anything like that and they're building lots of pipelines. And one of my uh, suggestions is perhaps that the Russians are going to run out of gas. We will need to reverse flow all of these pipelines and send Polish gas to Russia. And where is this gas? 
going to come from if they don't spend the money? And that's the really point. One final point, and I think this is the really big thing about shale. The really biggest thing about shale, ge geostrategically, is not about gas, it's about oil. It's first of all, shale oil being produced in the United States, making the US energy independent, and effectively dumping 10 million barrels a day on the, um, on the global oil markets. The bigger thing, though, than that is natural gas vehicles and the ability to shift from, in the US from using oil for uh, transportation to using gas. Gas becoming a second fossil fuel for transportation. And it's the potential for that, together with shale oil, which is likely to send the oil price down either at the end of this decade or early, early next decade. Right. I think that is the big, big issue. And that's the issue sh which should really be worrying Moscow. Okay. okay. Good. Well, now let's take a couple of questions for the gentleman over there. Um, do we have any microphones? Yes, I think there's a microphone. If you could just introduce yourself for people who don't know you, and then we'll take a question over there. If we have the microphone there next, please. Go ahead, sir. Not yet, but keep talking. It's Jan Tekau from Carnegie in Brussels. Speak loudly. Aye, here we go. I have two quick questions to Professor Riley. As the man who helped triggering the uh, commission movement against Gazprom, the antitrust uh, 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 motions that were taken, how much geopolitical value do you attach to that, to that process, to that antitrust uh, procedure that has been triggered? Is it really a potential geopolitical game changer for energy in Europe, or is it a mere technical kind of market competition question? And the second question, which is related, why did the Russians run into that trap? Um, because whoever you know, knows the free market zeal of the competition people in the commission usually you know, doesn't commit these kinds of relatively grave blunders that they have uh, committed, in my opinion. So I would like to hear your opinion on this. Thank you. Well, These are two excellent questions. I think, Alan, I'll answer those straight away, and then we'll take some more. OK, well, I think the geopolitical value is <coughs> partly linked to the indexation issue. If the commission rules that indexation is unlawful, that will have an immense impact on, on, on Gazprom in terms of its, its uh, overall power in the region and its value to the Russian state. Remember, one-third of the gas production of Russia is sold, more or less one-third, in Europe. That provides two-thirds of Gazprom's revenue. So if the Commission rules that indexation is unlawful, that results in a significant fall in the price of um, gas uh, in Europe. That, that would have a very significant major impact on the company itself. I think there is a, the other issue is actually about the suppression of competition question. If it turns out there is a significant number of examples of suppression of competition by Gazprom, most of them would appear to be linked, uh, if we understand the case properly, to the ownership or part ownership of pipelines by Gazprom. In that circumstance, and this is an issue which I don't think has been appreciated, is that the Commission would have the power to force sale of, the, the, of Gazprom's assets in the region. Now, if you end up doing that, the geostrategic implications of that in the region are very significant, because you are then looking at uh, the, a, a removal of a tremendous amount of Russian influence on the entire pipeline infrastructure. And of course, one of the issues about it is, and one of my questions about how this all works out, is that you know, this comes into the trap issue is I just don't think the Russian uh, state really thought this was serious. They thought it was a political issue, that, there was, that, that they didn't understand that DG competition works on the basis of evidence and legal procedure, and are just rolling the thing forward just as they have rolled it forward against all the major politically protected Western European energy companies. And I just don't think, uh, it's not that they didn't see the trap, they simply weren't aware a trap could possibly exist yeah. And that's now run, running forward against them. And the danger is, I think, that we could end up in a, quite a situation of very significant conflict, uh, co conflict. In the paper I wrote for SEPS, I talked about the Venusian Europeans uh, obsessed with legality and evidence, and the Martian Euro uh, Russians picking up the phone to various uh, foreign ministers across Europe and saying, stop this. And the foreign minister saying, it's nothing to do with us. This is a legal process. And the Russians simply not believing this. Yeah. So I think that's where we are. And we could get into a kind of super Microsoft conflict, as the Microsoft antitrust case was very conflictual, but we could get something into much more conflictual uh, in this space, but we'll see. Well, that's, that's fascinating, and I, lo I love the idea that we're now treating 
Microsoft the way the Commission, or well, Nigel and Gazprom, the way you used to treat Microsoft. That's very, I think it was Angela Merkel who urged the Commission to do that. Now, uh, we had a question, that, I apologize, I, um, the, these very energy efficient but bright lights, I mean, I can't actually see your face. There's a hand there, and then we go to Bruce Jackson next. Go ahead, sir. Uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mahash. I am from Ministry of Foreign Affairs of United Arab Emirates. <coughs> Uh, my question to the, to the panels, uh, first I would like to put a comment that uh, no doubt from the first speakers that energy and security is one of the strategic we're going to face in, in Europe at total, not only East Europe. Uh, and uh, Russia will use always, uh, it will be only the source today for East Europe and uh, as I understand, uh, in the future, if we go only to bend in one source, what is the alternative toward another source out of the European continent, especially in Middle East or Africa in terms of gas or oil? And also, what is the future of uh, clean energy in, uh, in the European? Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. And let's move on quickly to Bruce Jackson, who's just in front. If you can send the microphone to Bruce Jackson, who needs no introduction, but I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself. Bruce Jackson from Project on Transitional Democracies. Uh, Minister Sikorsky said that Gazprom uh, doesn't have the money for all these pipelines, and Professor Riley said that they don't have the gas for all these pipelines. If uh, Europe wanted to help Gazprom make decisions and tell them which are the better pipelines or the d more desirable from a European perspective, either existing or projected, what would be Europe's priorities of the pipelines that they want from the East? Very good. Unless you want to kill all of them. Well, I, I wonder if we're moving into a post-pipeline age. If there's one more question, I might just take... Yes, the gentleman here in the um, middle of the um, row down there. Perhaps someone can take a microphone to him. Thank you very much. My name is Kosir. Uh, Bell University of Banska Bystrica, Slovakia. Our Prime Minister underlined the importance of deepening widening as well as enlargement of the European Union in this quite comprehensive time period. I would like to ask, I would like to know uh, the opinion of all panelists concerning the following issue. Six, several years ago in Brussels was very popular and presented as perspective to setting up a common external energy policy of the European Union. My question is very simple. How needed and realistic is now a reaching this target. Thanks very much. I think I'll turn to Radek first on, on, on this. We, are, we still have this thing called the Eastern Partnership and it's having a summit in Vilnius in the autumn. For those of you who don't know, that's uh, the uh, Ukrainians, Belarusians, Moldovans and the three republics of the Caucasus are in a sort of special category for the, um, for, for the, for the EU. It isn't going terribly well, but is there, is there an energy dimension to this? Is, 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 is it, does it make sense to talk about an external energy policy for the, for, the, for the EU, which I think was the question? And do feel free to come back on any of the um, other questions asked as well. Um, I wouldn't write <coughs> off uh, Eastern Partnership, um, certainly not before Vilnius, because Vilnius is uh, going to be a test for it. And um, it could be that we will have a huge success of Eastern Partnership by the end of the year. Um, the, it is conceivable that we will have a signature with Ukraine, provided Ukraine does what it takes to convince um, uh, us that she's living by the um, values uh, that uh, we've jointly agreed. Um, and also, conclusion of negotiations of DCFTA with Moldova, um, uh, Georgia, and I think possibly even Armenia. Now, DCFTA is this terrible EU jargon. Um, and, and like everything in the EU, it is very bulky and very obscure. These uh, agreements are this thick. Uh, but what they actually mean is that these countries would be introducing into their own legal framework, the majority of EU law, and all of it in the trade and regulation area. 
This is a, 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 a legal revolution, a civilizational change. And if we get this at Vilnius, then I hope you'll say this is a huge success. Because if you look at what's happening in the south, where we have the Barcelona process and the uh, Union for the Mediterranean for the last, what, 10, 15 years, no single country is anywhere near to anything like this. Therefore, let's, um, let's, uh, let's let the jury uh, um, uh, make their judgment uh, and bring the verdict by, by the end of November this year. I'm, uh, Poland is certainly doing its best to support Lithuania in making the Vilnius summit a success. Um, now, on joint European um, energy policy, I'm not sure exactly what you mean. There are various, various people who understand different things about it. I'm sure Professor Riley um, uh, knows more about this than I. But I understand that one of the ideas that was being um, floated was joint purchases by the European Commission using our monopsony power, uh, the, the power of being the largest um, uh, consumer for some of these uh, uh, suppliers. Um, I, I'm not sure it's doable. I think we are uh, uh, on course to achieving a similar result by the measures uh, that Alan Riley uh, described. Um, and Bruce Jackson asks uh, about uh, what kind of pipeline we would like. Well, Poland is perfectly happy to um, build the second Yamal pipeline, meaning the second uh, transit pipeline uh, from Russia across Belarus, across Poland, to Germany. And Prime Minister President Putin has uh, recently said that uh, we are going back to Yamal. Um, he seems to mean something else by it. Uh, a pipeline going south, which uh, looks like a, um, a, a something to um, to connect to uh, the uh, uh, Slovakia Czech Republic system uh, without going through Ukraine. Um, uh, we know that the Ukrainian system also needs investment, um, but Russia could have this Yamal. Uh, two pipeline much cheaper than uh, extra Nord Stream pipes because um, you know the, the land is available all the infrastructure across rivers and the bridges are all there all you need to do is to lie, lay the second pipe which is what was envisaged in the original agreement in the first place um, but if you ask me more generally what Russia could could do to, um, um, to help the energy picture? Well, first of all, Russia is, I believe, still not applying uh, world prices on, in its domestic market. I mean, there is no going around um, the issue of um, energy uh, uh, preservation. I mean, you have, to, you have to charge people more. And of course, you can compensate uh, your consumers by other means. You know, if Ukraine had done this 20 years ago, she wouldn't be in the spot she's in today. Um, so Russia is still um, uh, uh, selling its gas uh, too cheaply to its, to its uh, citizens. And also, as far as I know, they are flaring billions of uh, oh, yeah. cubic meters of gas uh, uh, at the um, uh, oil um, wells. So they have plenty of room to uh, make themselves more efficient and to continue to live by, uh, by their main um, resource. Thanks very much. I just wanted to follow up. Th th there's no energy specific energy dimension to the Eastern Partnership. That was actually my, my question. It doesn't have a... It wouldn't, because the, the question was about why the EU doesn't have an external energy policy, and I was just wondering whether there's anything in there that would... Well, um, under Eastern Partnership, uh, uh, there is a fund, for example, uh, sponsored originally by Sweden, but others have now contributed to help Ukrainians become more energy right. efficient. But remember that Eastern Partnership energy-wise is actually very varied. Uh, Azerbaijan is a huge energy exporter, and 
and uh, Ukraine, Belarus, Moldova are, um, sure. uh, are importers, so to speak. Thank um, you. And of course, Armenia and Georgia as well. So I, I just don't see it. The, the, the three cheers for the Swedes, anyway. Um, Rekha, do you want to come back on any of, the, uh, any, any of those questions, maybe on green energy in Hungary or um, advice to Gazprom? <laughs> or what you'd like the Commission to do specifically to help with your problem to the South? No, I, th I think in many of these questions we are very much on the same uh, um, uh, wavelength because uh, what we also call in Hungary our secret weapon in solving some of these questions is uh, energy efficiency. And we have um, made uh, very serious attention, very serious investments into insulation, into uh, changing the old um, uh, 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 big panel houses that we inherited from. And I think the consumption decrease that we have seen as a result of that uh, and uh, to, as a result of many of the uh, changes in the industrial sector uh, is very visible. In 2010, for instance, Hungarian consumption was 14 billion BCM per year uh, that year, and now it's down to 10. So I think that's a very significant decrease, which shows that the market on the consumption side reacted really flexibly to definitely also to the uh, financial crisis's uh, uh, impact, but also to many of the political considerations behind using more green energy, uh, in which we're very rich uh, in uh, many ways, because the, although we have problems, we have tried the uh, shale gas development also, the stock is there, but the technology is not at that level, and I think in the longer term, we're also very interested in that. The political will is there behind it, so there is uh, very clear support on that side. But we have a lot of more available geothermal energy, for instance, that is very valuable in solving the heating systems of entire local localities in the country, and I think there's a long way to develop on that uh, side as well. So I think uh, <coughs> in this regard, uh, one of the most efficient ways to really uh, tackle these questions is to focus very clearly on the green energy and the um, uh, energy efficiency questions. Yeah. Mr. Um, Oriknovic, if I could ask you also about green energy, it's, for those of you here who follow this, the European carbon trading system is in a real mess. The price of carbon has fallen to almost nothing, so there's ab ab ability to use the market to push people in the green direction seems to be um, not working very well. How, how, how do your, mem your members traditionally are people who do oil and gas and generate electricity from oil and gas. How, how, how big a role does green energy play in, in your members' universe? Yeah, uh, that's a question about the farmers, you know, development we, we been an observer what's going on with the gas. Uh, I try to uh, focus on that firstly. Uh, you know, and it, we have a uh, uh, most probable, let us see the big potential in Poland and not, not only in that region. Uh, and once we are, well, let's say this is going step by step, not under being under control, but uh, it's a quite a long term process. Uh, but it had happened we, and we discovered the first shale gas. And we start with the production, then I am sure that it will expand. Uh, and then it will bring us to the totally different position that uh, tell to the players today in Europe that uh, shell gas production is uh, not uh, environmentally, uh, let's say, uh, wrong issue, so to speak. Yeah. It's not damages environment. It's uh, bringing us to the position that we may, having uh, our own production, we, we may uh, to change the, our economy being not dependent on others. I am not sure that we, I am not following that line. Some, somebody says that we may become uh, in a 10, 15 uh, years uh, export, gas exporter, but uh, uh, it's not as much, you know. But uh, anyway, we will balance in between Russia and Europe and having uh, interconnectors, we may exchange gas. And today, we are buying uh, from the West by that uh, interconnectors from Germany, but well, uh, we are buying uh, the same gas from gas. So cheaper a little bit, that's a kind of curiosity. It's uh, good for us uh, that exists, but um, uh, you know, that, that is going to change. We have to invest that, we have to invest in the shale gas, and uh, in terms of oil, 
that's not a big issue for us, and uh, especially in Europe, that's a quite a problem because we haven't, uh, you know, uh, that uh, in that territory the EU is mostly located. So we have to be dependent and trying to produce what we may uh, find on the Baltic Sea, let's say Baltic base, and uh, try to link with the Norwegian continental shelf uh, and get uh, as much as ever possible to, uh, let's say, also to balance the price uh, with ours, you know, on the market. What's going on today? And to the price uh, for crude oil is below 100 uh, US dollars per barrel uh, the first time, uh, you know, since uh, I think 12 months or even more. So that's a good news. But this is also, in my opinion, and information is bringing us to that position because uh, of that uh, uh, quite a high production of uh, tight oil in America. And that's kind of influences because, it, you know, some, uh, this uh, oil price and the other, this rather kind of a, a political, uh, let's say, uh, player's decision. Uh, the which price is today and tomorrow and because of that what's going on in the world. So, but uh, in general, production is becoming uh, a little bit bigger than the, the client expectations over than the needs. So that will, uh, you know, uh, continue. You know, it's good for us, good for economy, but we have to, we have to uh, try to, let's say, properly behave being here uh, utilizing uh, our own resources, own indigenous uh, energy, and uh, trying to define our position uh, here a little bit, uh, being more independent mm -hmm. uh, from the, let's say, east side, and to play uh, the role of the coordinator, supporting others, as uh, Minister Sikorski said, you know, we are looking for not only neighbors, direct neighbors, but others uh, who might be the friends, you know, for further, uh, let's say, logic and solution. Right, thanks very much indeed. <coughs> Alan, do you want to come back very quickly on any of those points, or should we go I, for another? I, I, I just, I mean, one of the problems with the common energy policy, I mean, it, it is very difficult um, to create any sort of common energy policy for European states are very different. Article 194 of the treaty is very confusing. It goes kind of both ways. It essentially, though, says that the energy mix is up to the me each me individual member state. Um, I think the real where area where Europe comes in is where it can specifically add value. So, for example, in terms of um, this uh, idea of any international agreement uh, on energy supply, you get a, 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 um, some a relationship with the Commission uh, to look at the deal. That could be very valuable in enhancing uh, the power of the member state to get a better deal. That's really very useful. Specific powers in relation to uh, dealing with uh, supply routes. So, for example, the power given by the member states for the Commission to negotiate in relation to the Trans-Caspian pipeline, although I do think that's somewhat heroic, and says, if they ever manage to deliver that, I will be amazed. But, you know, okay, they could do that. I think there are certain specific things which, uh, uh, which, uh, where the union can play a, a role, but the states are so different. Uh, and we have to recognize the real heterogeneity between the states here, which is, which is really vital. The only other points I would make, the Eastern Pe Partnership, is there, I mean, what's really interesting is, you know, Belarus has got shale, Ukraine has got shale, I don't know if Moldova's got shale, but the idea of perhaps creating a, a shale know-how project, perhaps with American support within the Eastern, project, Eastern Partnership, that might be something which is worthwhile exploring. The only other point I would make was in relation to Ukraine, and uh, there's a lot of criticism of Ukraine, but you have to say that in, in, in the, what the government appears to have done uh, with the reverse pipeline, reverse flow pipeline deal which was done recently, the shale gas uh, with Chevron and Shell, and with the LNG terminal, they are actually trying to finally make steps to um, actually change their supply security position. And that should be applauded and supported, I think. Well, thanks so much. Um, so Judy Dempsey, who's been covering this region, I think, longer than any, 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 anybody else. I think you moved to Vienna in 1980 or something amazing like that. You, you're the 19, even earlier, fantastic. Um, so a very, very quick question um, from you, and then we'll take a quick answer. 
um, I, I see Hungary is having a debate about upgrading the Pax nuclear stations. Lithuania is involved in this as well. At any time in the discussions over uh, energy, future energy strategy, have any of you ever considered the impact of Germany's decision to abandon nuclear energy? Um, I think I'll leave that to the two uh, practitioners of uh, politics, Recker and Radek. Uh, how, how big a role does Germany, Germany's decision to abandon nuclear energy play in your thinking? Well, I, th I think they have a problem, don't they? They need to find 20,000 <laughs> megawatts, 20,000 megawatts, 20, megawatts, and quickly. And uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but in order to get to the high planes of, uh, of um, uh, renewable, they're actually building coal-fired um, yeah, plants, um, not the straightest of routes. strategic impact on the decisions Poland or Hungary or Ukraine would make? I think that was a strategic impact, wasn't it? Uh, Rekha, you, well, Radek's thinking about that. Do you want to try and answer it? Yeah, I think we have uh, been considering for quite some time the development of the Pax nuclear facility. Uh, we have been e even, even um, uh, um, uh, successful in getting the political understanding and support behind it. So there is a political will uh, the, the, uh, behind this question. Now when that is going to be timely is another question because I think at this moment we have a surplus of gas, natural gas in the foreseeable future. Um, but it's obviously uh, an indispensable part of the energy mix that we will have. And I think, uh, depending on uh, how we will sort of see un unfolding this uh, question of the um, uh, surplus gas uh, and the uh, uh, the new contract, uh, new long-term contract or new contract that we will have uh, for Hungary's supply, uh, how that at that moment the situation looks. So I think it's a it's a longer-term question. Right. Well, thanks very much indeed. Well, I'm afraid out of time, and I would hesitate very much to take any time away from one of the greatest speakers and thinkers on um, this region that uh, we, we have, which is Big Brzezinski. So I'm going to ask you, first of all, to join me in thanking the panel very much indeed for their excellent contributions. <laughs>